Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. New intro, you probably noticed. Um, some of you liked it, some of you didn't. I, I'm not entirely sure, I think I might stick with it. Then again, I might not, I might try something new. We'll, we'll see how it goes, but none of you came here to watch an intro. Today, we have a pretty spectacular game for you, in the German Tier 10 battleship, the Grosser Kurfürst. Today's replay was sent in by... You know what, I'm not even going to try to say his name. <laughs> it's just... no. And I'm certainly not going to be repeating that name all throughout the course of today's video, so you know what that means, don't you? Yep, it's the return of Dave. Dave's back. It's been a while since we saw Dave in World of Warships, and he's divisioned up with two friends who have at least moderately pronounceable names. We have Machine 19861 in the French Tier 10 cruiser, the Henri, and up ahead there in the Shimakaze is another division mate, Meaty Bites. And there they are. The first thing that struck me about this particular replay was the fact that the team are actually communicating with each other in chat at the start of the battle. They're trying to decide who's going to go where, what kind of radar support they're going to get, where are the radar cruisers going, who's going to back them up. This is very, very encouraging. It's so rare to see teams actually doing this. In fact, I'm already getting a warm, fuzzy feeling about this team. It doesn't mean they're going to win, of course. <laughs> you see, that's always the thing, isn't it? It doesn't matter how objectively good or bad your team were. You always see the same thing whenever you lose. Shit team, noobs, you all suck, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's not necessarily always the case. I mean, okay, a lot of the times it is, but sometimes your team were good. It's just the enemy team were better. Let's not forget. There's another team on the other side of the map doing their level best to screw you over. And sometimes they're just better at it than you are. It doesn't mean your team was bad. Sometimes the enemy team is just better. Two destroyers on the enemy team. You've got meaty bites up ahead there in the Shimakaze scouting. He's already spotted a couple of targets. And of the two destroyers on the enemy team, well, one's a Kabarovsk, so he doesn't really need to worry about that. He's going to see that one coming well in advance. But the other one's an Akazuki. And that could potentially cause Meaty Bites and the Shemakazi there some problems. Not to mention the radar cruisers on the enemy team. They do have a couple. They have a Baltimore, a Cleveland, and a Des Moines. Speaking of the Des Moines, well, the other destroyer on Dave's team, the Asashio, has already found the Des Moines. And that's really bad news for him. He's attempting to cap Charlie. You see, Meaty Bites is already capping Bravo. And he's doing it completely uncontested. But sometimes if you're in a destroyer in a high-tier game... It can be wise to not immediately rush for one of the capture circles, at least until you know where the radar cruisers are. The friendly Asashio has already found the enemy Des Moines, one of the Anagos, and the Kabarosk. Which is kind of surprising. Because the Asashio hasn't actually taken any damage. Everybody's shooting at the Baltimore over there. Which suggests that the enemy Des Moines either hasn't used his radar, despite the fact that there's clearly a destroyer in the capture circle or he doesn't actually have radar maybe he's a spotter plane Des Moines maybe he's a Des Memes. both are possible I guess we're going to find out anyway back to Dave oh Missouri yeah oh cool well yeah I was forgetting the Missouri also has radar so the enemy team actually have a fourth radar ship now, under normal circumstances, this would be a paddling of epic proportions. If Dave had been in a Montana or a Yamato, that Missouri would be in a world of trouble right now. But he's not. He's in the Grosser Cur first. And while his secondaries are opening up at this kind of range, yes, Dave has a secondary spec Grosser Cur first here. The main gun batteries are just not very good at this kind of range. See, this is the... Well, sort of defining characteristic of German battleships. I mean, he's got shots at the broadside of the enemy Grosser Kurfürst over there at extreme range, and he just doesn't bother. Because the chances of actually doing any kind of meaningful damage with the Grosser Kurfürst's guns at that kind of range are slim. Not impossible. I've seen people pull off some ridiculous shots at extreme range with the Grosser Kurfürst guns. But generally speaking, these German battleships are brawlers. You've got to get in close. Not just because of the secondaries, but also because the main battery guns, well, they just like chewing up targets at medium to short range. Of course, that doesn't mean you should just suicide rush straight down the middle of the map. 
and get yourself subjected to a hail of fire from multiple different directions from all kind of enemy cruisers, battleships and destroyers. And if you're really lucky, aircraft carriers as well. And it looks like Dave is suicide rushing down the middle of the map, but, well, he's not quite that stupid. See, from here... Well, he's already given the enemy Des Moines a spot of good news. And yeah, okay, he's taken fire from the other side of the map over by the Alpha Cap zone, but that's not going to last for much longer. Now he's got this island blocking any shots from the western end of the map. And look at those enemy ships on the far side of that island. If they have to withdraw, and they probably are going to have to withdraw, guess who's going to get shots at close range into their broadsides? Yeah. You see, this is what I'm talking about. And he's been radared, so that's probably the Des Moines. I don't know what the Des Moines is expecting to do about it, because he can't shoot over that mountain. Of course, you know... <laughs> I don't know. Well, actually, no, they're, they're going for the Asashio. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. And the Asashio is dumping smoke, which isn't going to help him because he's been radared. <laughs> I don't think you quite understand how this whole radar thing works. Of course, if the Asashio has been radared, then Meaty Bites and the Shimakaze has probably been radared as well. And this Alsace. Ooh, I think that's a Yamato shooting at him. See, what's the Alsace going to do? If he turns left now, to get shots into those enemy ships over there. He's going to expose the broadside of his ship to the enemy Yamato. And that's going to hurt. Actually, there are two enemy Yamatos over there. And a Grosser Kerr first. I don't think that Asashio is going to make it out of there alive. The Des Moines is definitely gunning for him. As well he should be. Yeah, he's probably done. And, yeah, okay, so the Asashio is down. And the Des Moines has shot down the spotter aircraft, which was circling overhead. So it doesn't look like the enemy team are going to withdraw from this position after all. But that doesn't matter, because in this position, Dave can actually punish them if they advance into Charlie as well. And he's doing it without being spotted. Meaty Bites there dumping a whole bunch of torpedoes in the direction of the enemy Kabarovsk. Be interesting to see if any of those hit. And this is quite safe for Meaty Bites too, because he knows that the Des Moines has already used his radar. So he's safe for the next couple of minutes. Now, are there going to be any spotter planes up there that are going to see these torpedoes? Because there's the Missouri. And there go the secondaries. The Missouri's guns aren't even pointing in this direction. At this kind of range, even the Grosser Kerfurst guns can... Oh, hello! There's the enemy Antigo. That's bad news for the Alsace. But those torpedoes are incredibly bad news for the Missouri. Now, the Atago over there did just dump his torpedoes into the Alsace. Oh, yeah, the Alsace is coming under concentrated fire from that guy. There's the Des Moines, sailing broadside onto a grosser curve first. Well, the range isn't great, and he's not inside secondary range, but that actually looks pretty good. Eh, well, could have been better, could have been worse. It's the grosser curve first, what are you going to do? And, yeah, the Alsace has been sunk. He's actually been sunk by the enemy Kronstadt, who's down in the southern end of the map. You see, this is what I'm talking about. Battleships that overcommit. Camping at the back of the map is one thing, and it's bad if you're in a battleship, but just charging forward can be equally bad. The Alsace retreated from the cap point over there because he didn't want to get burned down by the Kabarosk. The Kabarosk was actually punishing him quite badly. But in doing so, coming around here, he's exposed himself to a crossfire. He was getting shot at by the Des Moines and potentially the Kabarovsk and the Atago from one side. He was getting shot at by the Yamatos and the Grosser Kerfurst from the other side. And as it happens, the Kronstadt. And the Kronstadt's the one that actually sank him. Still that pesky Des Moines over there, though. Although he's, well, running out of friends very, very quickly. Question is, does he have his radar back up? Again, the range is not ideal, but these are a lot of guns, <laughs> and at some point, if you throw enough shit at the wall, yeah, that'll do. No citadels, but enough of it's going to stick. Now, if he's got his radar back up, he could make things very, very interesting for Miki points there in the Shimakaze, although he is playing it safe, and he's tucked in well behind that island, but the Kabarosk 
could be a problem. Yeah, Meaty Bites is powering up his engines. With the Kabarosk approaching, he's not going to hang around there. And there's Dave's first kill. He's managed to get the Des Moines. But he pulled back just far enough in order to be able to get shots on the target there. That he has momentarily exposed himself to crossfire from the other side of the map. So he's powering up the engines again, nice and slow. He's just inching back into cover, and there's the cadder. I have just unlocked that thing, by the way. It is amazing. I absolutely love it. But it's one of the most selfish ships in the game. It's no good as a scout, it's no good for contesting caps, but it is really, really good at farming damage. It's kind of a bit of a guilty pleasure for me. A couple of over-penetrations there. No actual battleship armor-piercing penetrations. I realise that this is a bit of a concern for destroyer players. Battleship armor-piercing shells actually arming and doing full damage to destroyers when they shouldn't. They should just over-penetrate. Uh, Wargaming, I don't know if you're aware of the news, but... Some time ago, Wargaming announced that they were attempting to address the issue. And I know this sounds counterintuitive, but they were attempting to address the issue by reducing the armour on destroyers. The theory being that a battleship armour-piercing shell should not fuse. It shouldn't arm itself, and it should just over-penetrate, rather than doing a proper penetration and full damage. Which is what you would expect. Well, they're not doing that. <laughs> so, destroyer players, you can relax. It, well, in a way. You see, the issue was that suddenly cruiser armor-piercing started to do lots and lots of full penetration damage to destroyers. So the idea that they were going to fix this problem, and it did fix the problem as far as battleship armor-piercing was concerned, but it kind of just opened up a whole new can of worms with cruiser armor-piercing. So they're still working at the problem of battleship armor-piercing doing full penetration damage when their shots hit destroyers. Oh, hello, there's the Akazuki. Well, it was about time. The enemy have completely dominated Alpha, and now they're squeezing in from the western side of the map. And this is kind of going to be a bit of a problem, because that's a Yamato. See, this is kind of the problem that the Alsace was experiencing earlier. Right now, Dave is coming under fire from, at the moment, two, and potentially three different directions. Yeah, he's got that on his flank. But, well, it's another grosser curve first. He's got nothing better to shoot at, so he's going to take some shots. And you can see those turrets swinging around and pointing this way, because, hey, broadside of a battleship to shoot at, so why the hell not? But he's definitely not going to expose the broadside of this ship to that Yamato. He's quite content to take his chances against another grosser curve first, firing at him from very long range. But you're not going to do that with a Yamato. Then again... The Yamato, Ooh, if only these shots would... No. <laughs> Bit of a double-edged sword here. The spit of land sticking out from the side of that island is preventing the Yamato from getting any shots at him, but it's also preventing him from getting any shots at the Yamato. And he's got his sonar running, so that Akazuki is not going to surprise anybody. And I'm looking at the Cleveland here and I'm thinking, don't do it, Cleveland. <laughs> do not sail around that corner and get blapped by the Yamato. I don't care how badly you want to sink the Akazuki. But the Cleveland's smarter than he at first appears. He knows exactly what's going to happen to him if he broadsides a Yamato at that kind of range. This Akazuki, on the other hand, I mean, he has to know that Sonar is up. He's inside Sonar range. He has to know that he's being Sonar. So I don't know what the hell this guy... What did he think he was going to achieve by doing that? <laughs> I really don't know. I think the only person that came as a surprise to was the Akazuki. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> right. So, again, a potentially dangerous situation. But the Yamato is now on the other side of the island. And there's some long-range fire coming in over the top of the island trying to hit him. But he pretty much has this Kronstadt. Well, not all to himself because there's plenty of people queuing up to take shots at him. But the Kronstadt, and let's not forget the Kabarosk, who's inside that smoke screen, these guys are definitely the lesser threat. That lot over there, lobbing shots clean over the island, and the Yamato on the other side of the island are definitely the bigger threat. So he needs to kill this Kronstadt. And he also probably needs to deal with the Kabarosk, who's threatening to burn him down from within the safety of his smoke screen. 
Unfortunately, his sonar is now out. You can really use some radar around about now. But the Kronstadt is doomed. There's just no way he's going to survive that hail of fire. And there's the kill. And there's the Kavaros. And it looks like the rear turrets are ready to go. And... Is that a double strike? It is. <laughs> and now, he has lost a lot of health. But he's relatively safe. Because he's now angled against all of the threats behind him. So they're almost certainly going to start shooting at that very unfortunate Cleveland instead. Because he is much more vulnerable. I have to admit, I'm kind of surprised at his choice of fire here. He's going for the hipper. When he had the broad side of the Yamato to shoot at, and again, he is spreading his bets around, and he is shooting at the Yamato as well. And of course, the secondaries are doing their job too. Perhaps he thought he had a better chance of sinking the hipper outright, or perhaps he's just spreading his shots around in an effort to delay the capture of Bravo there. Because let's face it, the team are outnumbered two to one at the moment, and it's going to be worse than that in a second because that Cleveland has not survived. And there's the Confederate award. So they're now down to two ships. I missed it in all the excitement, but Meaty Bites is dead. The Shimakaze has been sunk. The only two surviving ships on the team are Dave in the Grosser Kurfurst, and he does not have a lot of health. And oh, he's managed to burn the Yamato down. And uh, Machine in the Henri. Now they do have the points advantage, but they don't have the cap advantage. And they definitely don't have the numbers advantage. And he's on fire. And he doesn't have a huge amount of health. He's used his damage repair, and it's going to be on cooldown very, very soon. He still has his sonar ready to go, but there's... Well, there could be a torpedo threat from the hippers, I suppose. One of which he's managed to set on fire with his secondaries. And he's actually scoring hits with his main gun batteries as well. And if that hipper knows what's good for him, he's going to attempt to get into cover around the side of that island. That is, in fact, exactly what he's doing. Of course, that means he's going to expose the broadside. But he's been set on fire again. And while those shots did hit, they did not sink the hipper. Now, 20,000 health. Heal on cooldown. Being chased by an enemy grosser Kurfurst with vastly superior health. And two enemy cruisers, two Admiral Hippers, both firing high explosive at him. There's his only surviving teammate, Machine in the Henri IV. Does not have a lot of health. Trying to do what he can to help him out. By putting some high explosive into that grosser curve first. And there's the Witherer award. And that's almost, well, in fact, 100% down to his secondary gun battery. And there's 224, 225,000 damage in the high caliber award. And while that enemy grosser curve first isn't exactly giving him the broadside, he's definitely angling against the wrong ship. <laughs> because machine in the Henri is firing high explosive. You can't angle against high explosive. Oh, he is giving broadside now. You know what that is, boys and girls. <laughs> That's a paddling. It's also a kraken. Well, let's not start celebrating just yet. They have the points advantage, 943 points, but they only hold one cap. Now, he's no longer detected, but there's probably still some high explosive whizzing through the air in his direction. Yep. Oh, no, it's armor-piercing. Holy shit, that was Yamato armor-piercing. <laughs> the enemy Yamato timed it perfectly, caught him just as he was given the broadside, so that was incredibly lucky. It's a damn good job. His damage repair party just came off cooldown, or well, that would probably have sunk him. Now, he's spotted. Why is he turning towards the ships that are spotting him? Surely you should be running away, that's what his teammate over there is doing, but he's in a cruiser. He can't afford to get hit. Now, you could argue that Dave can't afford to get hit, but he can't exactly run away from a pair of Admiral Hippers that are shadowing him, either. A Hipper can easily keep him spotted while staying out of detection range. Remember that. Oh, more Yamato armor piercing. Remember, a Hipper can easily keep him spotted while staying out of detection range. Which is what makes this all the more hilarious. I'm just going to pause things here. You see that puff of gun smoke over there in the direction of the central cap point? That's one of the hippers shooting at Dave. Now, he's not going to get spotted because he's fired his guns. No, he's going to get spotted and he's firing his guns because he's just strayed into surface detection range. And the reason he's done that is because he's trying to reverse away 
from a charging grosser curve first. And with the team on 967 points, that is Dave's sixth kill, 1000 points and victory. Thank you very much, Admiral Hipper. And on that bombshell, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Dave, TGSR, thank you very much for sending that one in. Very much enjoyed watching it. Very much enjoyed doing the commentary. And I hope everybody else enjoyed it too, because that's it for today. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.